next strategy with the name in the book of agency incentives or incentive alignment. So the book already uses two words for that strategy. Let's repeat, agent incentives and incentive alignment, which is, in my view, the better word. Why? Because it helps you to remember what are we talking about? Oh, we are talking about solving the principal agent issue. And when the incentives of the agents are aligned with the interests of the principal, then you have the perfect world. So the idea of this second theme is how can we create incentives in such a way that the principal is happy. And then we have um, two, two ways. Ex ante, ex post. Ex ante is called the trusty approach or trusteeship approach, which is a funny way of aligning the interest because it's a castration form. Think of emperors in thousand years ago who had bodyguards who were castrated. And then there is no interest to appropriate value because you're not entitled to any value in the first place. Trustee is the word that should be connected in your uh, head to the supervisory board, the non-executive board members. They earn $5,000 a year just to show up at supervisory board meeting. And here comes the magic word independence. They are seen or at least portrayed as independent to stress, to point at the ID or hope that they have no interest in, no financial interest in the whole operation of the company <coughs> at stake. In the first week, in the second week, are already warned for the word independent. Because when you talk about independence, you think of state organs who, on behalf of the society, independently decide things. <coughs> Take, for instance, a judge. Here we are not talking about state appointees. No, no. These are just commercial persons who are part of the board, but then the non-executive flavor, on the continent quite often called supervisory board, in the two-tier version, but you know, still board members. But you see that in this strategy, the idea is to emphasize that they are as much as possible independent. And not after getting their salary from this job. So you recruit supervisory or non-executive board members from board members that earn their money in other companies. And then in the weekend, they are non-executive board. So they are board member at KPN, five million a year, and then supervisory board member at Shell for 5,000 a year. You know, coffee money, expensive coffee. Well, maybe the number depends on the size, eh? so sometimes 20,000, but in the view, when you're earning millions, Anything up to $100,000 is sort of nothing, you know? That's maybe difficult to appreciate as a, at your age, yeah, but, but that, that's the, your destiny a little bit. So they, they get nothing. Question? The supervisory board, is that a synonym for non-executive board? Yes, question is, the supervisory board, whether that is a synonym for the non-executive board? Uh, in the broad sense, yes, in, this, in the narrow sense, you use the word non-executive board member when you talk about a one-tier board. So this one organ view with two colors on around the same table. 
the non-executive gray-haired colors and the executive non-gray-haired colors, eh, to put it in that way. And in the two-tier language, you're saying, no, those are two organs, or two parts, two kidneys. One organ, two parts. Um, with each kidney a independent role, and then the supervisory board is supervising the executive board. So when you read those words, check whether it is the narrow or the broad sense of the word. If it is specifically about one tier, two tier, uh, then, then you should adopt to that language. But the underlying idea is, thanks to theory, that either way they are the trusteeship approach in terms of legal strategy. How is that done? That is done in legislation. So those those company laws, China, Netherlands, Germany, they says there is a supervisory board, dot. Shareholders appoint independent persons in the supervisory board, dot. The task of the supervisory board is to supervise the executive board, dot. Three clauses of legislation. Or in the one tier legislations, and the funny thing, in the European Union, we have both, and on the exam, we might use the piece of legislation of Brussels, the EU federal legislation, the regulation on the European company. And in that legislation, there's this option of one tier, two tier. And then it says in two tier, what I just said. And then when it says in the subsection on one tier, if you choose a one tier, then the shareholders appoint executive members of the board who run the company, operating machine X, selling product X, and the distributing the profit at the end of the year, and the shareholder appoints non-executive members of the one-tier board, dot. The task of the non-executive board members is to supervise the executive board members. And the benefit of a one-tier board is that they're in the same room. So when they meet together, the supervising is going immediately. And if it is two kidneys, two sub-organs, then the executive board, so the regular board, sends their IDs to the supervisory board, you know, so, so, so you need mailmen and miscommunication potential. And then they receive whatever they have to supervise, and then they have to mail that. Thank you for receiving your IDs. We think this and this and this. So go ahead, or something like that. And so the um, persons who favor the one-tier board think that the two-tier board is inefficient. And the intellectuals who favor the two-tier board think that in a one-tier board, no way to be able to independently supervise, in the language of today, to take your trustee role trustee on behalf of the shareholder, the principal. Okay, so that is the um, ex ante flavor. And then more um, known to the general public is the ex post, because that is the reward, that is the salary bonus, etc. And then the best trick in the ex post incentive, exposed as in you get your salary at the end, or you get the bonus at the end. And the best trick is to pay in shares. And that's the best way to align the interest of principal and agent, because the agent is the manager and the principal is the shareholder. The interest of the shareholder is, one, to get profit, but most of all, that the share price increases. The value of the share increases. And if a board member is paid with shares, then the interest of the agent is that the share is as valuable <coughs> as possible. And then you align those two interests, and then everybody's happy. 
how does such a legislative regulatory strategy look like? Again, in the law, it says you may pay in salary or you may pay in share. And then you make arrangement how, for instance, the voting rights of those board member shares are done. And how you administratively arrange those future shares for board members. Because remember, shares exist or do not exist. So on 1st of January, they exist. But the board member gets the shares when he performs three years and stays within the company after three years. So who is then the owner of those shares that in three years' time are owned by the um, board member? Because you, get, you give them after they perform, not in the beginning. Because they say, thank you for the shares, goodbye. And then the law says, okay, Shares may be owned by the company with the purpose to be given to a board member. Because if a law does not say so, then this is sort of for Munchausen that the legal entity owns itself, which is sort of bizarre when you look at it from the core characteristic. So this is why the law is involved in this strategy by allowing that those shares may be taken care of by the company itself. And then it says, but without voting rights until they are given to the board member. Otherwise they can already start voting on their shares they do not have yet, etc. Second example, tax law. So all those jurisdictions have tax law and income tax and they make explicit arrangements for this type of salary and in most cases that you don't have to pay taxes until you get them and in most jurisdictions that is the beauty of capitalism that you're not taxed on the um, uh, ownership of the shares as such with the exception of for instance the Netherlands where even owning shares result in box free um, um, property tax uh, as may be known by a few of you but that's not important all right so um, how could you also call such a salary arrangement you could call it the equity based compensation because remember the shares are from a bookkeeping perspective called equity and it comes out of this pool. Um, why? Because it does not come from this pool. That is why you could call it equity compensation. Well, and then the thing is, obviously, and most um, uh, de 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 deliberations are on this, is what is then the correct amount of percentage of shares to get the effect that your interest is aligned. Should it be a lot or a little or one year waiting time or three years waiting time? And those are topics that are discussed in uh, human resource managers conferences and uh, that's one of the potential MBAs you can do uh, to look into this. And in the dispersed shareholdership situation of this course, eh, the shareholders on the Bahamas, then it's such an important issue that nowadays in most jurisdictions, the supervisory board or the non-executive board members have a additional task in the, in the rem remuneration committees or the compensation committees to think through these schemes partly as a response to societal upheaval of the bonuses at the top, whatever that may mean, but also in the deeper intellectual approach that you ask yourself, but how do I know that giving shares are actually doing the job of aligning the interest? Or is it just a habit or a very clever trick 
of managers who say, well, give me shares, because then I will love you. You could say, I appoint you, and that is reason enough to love me. That's sort of the Valentine dilemma. Is that a justification for a expensive dinner or not? And start like it. You get the point? And that is then a critical thing and maybe potentially a better thesis topic because you could look at this from an empirical perspective, asking managers, did you feel aligned or not because of the share? or questions like this. Or that you try with a mathematical approach and statistics to see whether in different uh, jurisdictions it works out differently uh, because of sort of the fine tuning of, of these types of rules. Interesting topic as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then I forgot to mention the topic of week seven, that is the workers' rights. One of the trusteeship-like <coughs> participants is not independent um, supervisory board members or non-executive board members, but workers members. So that you put in your non-executive board individuals that are employed by the same company, which could be seen as a trustee or as a sort of balancing act because then there are different types of interest in that supervisory board, including those of the stakeholders called employee, as a variation. To remember, is this trusteeship independence type of assistant shareholders and the exposed rewards incentive alignment approach, and each time supported by legislative measures, phrases, clauses in legislation. And quite often, the legal strategy is just that the law says it is allowed to do it this way. And remember, the fact that legal persons exist because of the law says that they are allowed to exist, that's not very um, surprising that, that a few more details are arranged pertaining to that legal entity you invented with legislation in the first place. So we have now two examples of the legal strategies, three more to go after a break of 11 minutes. See you in a bit.